we come now to uh, what some have called the epilogue to the book of the Revelation. <clears throat> In this vision, the end of the world has been seen, and the new heavens and the new earth have been revealed to the Apostle John. And in these last few verses of chapter 22, the saints are now given some exhortations concerning what has been seen. <clears throat> and these exhortations are, are given by the Apostle John and by an angel and from Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> and we'll see here, uh, well not only here, but in, in uh, all the New Testament scriptures, there's a notable difference in the way the Lord communicates with his people under the new covenant than the way he did under the old covenant. We've uh, noted this, even Sister June noted this today, that in the old covenant there are some passages of scripture where there's very little commentary by the Holy Spirit or there's, there's not any assessment of what's happened. It's just raw data, raw facts. He said and she said and he did and they did and, and they just go on and, and sometimes some some people don't know, well, like in this account, who was right and who was wrong. But now in the New Covenant, it's different. We've got, we've got the words of Christ himself. We've got the apostles that expound upon what Jesus said. And the New Testament scriptures are just loaded with exhortations, like to help us come to the right conclusions about what, what has been revealed, about what, is, what God is doing. So that's what we see here in the end of this book is exhortation. What John saw and heard here is called the book of the Revelation. He saw a vision of heaven centered around the throne. He saw Christ enthroned. He saw what God is doing in the world through Jesus Christ up to the time of the end. And some of it is difficult to understand in the present time. But now that's the reason why John's vision comes with angelic commentary and exhortation. <clears throat> Unlike Ezekiel's visions and Daniel's visions, in the book of the Revelation, the Lamb speaks from heaven. And angels give exhortations to every believer who reads it. This, this book is so important and valuable to the people of God that it is said, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is, it, as, is at hand. And also, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed is he which keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And blessed are they that do his commandments. Now these are all conclusions and exhortations founded upon what John saw in his vision, which is a vision for all the people of God. So now at the conclusion of the vision of the New Jerusalem, and really this is the conclusion to the entire book of the Revelation, there are 16 verses devoted to help the saints come to the right conclusions about what we've read in this book. So Jesus speaks to us, and an angel speaks to us, and John speaks to us here in the end. <clears throat> John writes in verse 6 that the angel who showed him the holy city speaks first. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. Now he is this angel that joined John first in chapter 21 and verse 9. He's the one that said, Come hither and I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. That's this angel. And we learned this is also one of the angels that had one of the seven vials of wrath. <clears throat> so everything that John was shown from chapter 21 verse 9 up to now was shown by this particular angel. But he doesn't say these things are faithful and true or this vision or these pictures, but he says these sayings are faithful and true. Although the angel hasn't said anything to John since back when he first joined him in chapter 21 verse 9. John just tells us what he sees. The angel hasn't spoken to him, but he says these sayings. <clears throat> So he's not limiting this to just uh, what John has just saw and seen in these last two chapters. This is these sayings are the the entire book of the Revelation that he's speaking about. <clears throat> these are the final words to the entire Revelation that John saw, and some believers go further and say 
this is like the, the final words of the New Testament scriptures. And some go further yet and say these are the final words, the angels speaking of the entire Bible. We call the Bible the Holy Scriptures. Uh, my, my personal persuasion is he's just talking about the book of the Revelation. And that's because of what we, we hear from Jesus in the next verse. Jesus says the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This book being the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and of course when, when John wrote this, there was, no, uh, there was no Bible as we know it. Although it's generally agreed that the book of the Revelation was the last book in Scripture to be written. But to my knowledge, it was not all compiled into a Bible at this point. <clears throat> so it seems unlikely that that's what the angel would be speaking about. But anyway, beyond that, he says that these words are, these sayings are faithful and true. And we might say, well, of course they're faithful and true. This is in the Bible. <clears throat> this, you might think that, well, this, was it really necessary for the angel to say this to confirm that these words, these sayings are faithful and true? <clears throat> well, there are times that we need to hear about what we already know. We need powerful affirmations of the things that we already believe. John was given this book to deliver to the churches, to those who are believers, who would be living by faith in this world, having a Savior in heaven, having forgiveness of sins and eternal life, and having the devil come down to us having great wrath. So it's good to hear one of the faithful holy angels confirm to us that these sayings are faithful and true. Not only what Jesus said in this book, but what all the holy angels have said and the things that John has written. He's not just speaking to John, he's speaking to all who read these sayings. Everything written in this book of the revelation of Christ, these sayings are faithful and true. When an angel tells you that these things that you have heard are faithful and true, your first reaction should be to be determined to believe it. Come what may, whether it be the seven trumpets or the seven vials of wrath or the seven plagues, or the great wrath of the devil, or the beast, or the kings of the earth and their armies encompassing the camp of the saints, we are going to live our lives in this world with the unwavering conviction that these sayings are faithful and true. Whatever happens, we know it's the Lamb removing the seals from the book and opening the book that he took from the Father's right hand. We have seen the vision. We have heard the sayings. We have seen how all of this is going to end. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, yeah. and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness, and we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Amen. These sayings are faithful and true. God is faithful. Christ is faithful. The holy angels are faithful. And these sayings that were given to John to record are faithful. That is, they are trustworthy and unalterable. They are to be believed. John didn't have a fantasy. He had a vision. <clears throat> a revelation of Jesus Christ who is himself the amen and the faithful and true witness. When heaven was open in chapter 19, John saw and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. <clears throat> and these sayings <clears throat> are the record of what he is going to do the faithful and true one. The Lord's Christ, the Lamb of God, will not be hindered in fulfilling all his will. And the angel gives further testimony of the truth of these things. Not only does he personally testify that these sayings are faithful and true, but he reminds us of his Lord and our Lord, the one who sent him for this purpose. Again in verse 6, And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Now this 
this holy angel brings up the holy prophets to affirm the truth of his own ministry also and of what John has been given in this book. This is how God works. He gives his word to his prophets and when the due time comes he fulfills his what he said he would do according to the prophet's word. <clears throat> Believers know that what the prophet said is true and has come to pass or will come to pass. <clears throat> so by saying this, the angel is confirming that what was seen and heard by John is true because it came from God. Mm -hmm. And he's also indicating the nature of what has been seen and heard. This book is, is both revelation and prophecy. It's given to show the things which must shortly be done. <clears throat> the fact that it came from God and that it is set in the context of the holy prophets and that a holy angel showed it to us and that the angel himself testified of the faithfulness and truthfulness of it all impress upon us the infallibility of God's word. <clears throat> and the word of the angel also takes on a larger scope than just a conversation between him and John. The Lord God sent his angel to show unto his servants, plural. This is to all believers. Whoever reads this book, this angel is speaking to you. Amen. God gave this vision, for, this vision for all of his servants. So every believer who reads, who reads John's book of the Revelation ought to be able to interpret the things going on around them. Every believer who reads this book ought to receive strength and encouragement for traveling through this world. Every believer who reads this book ought to know that our Savior in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, ruling from heaven, is the one who is conducting all the happenings in the earth. Every believer ought to know what is going to happen and how the world is going to end. Every believer ought to know what to expect in the world to come. The Lord God of the Holy Prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants these things. And he says, he says the things which must shortly be done. Now there are two very small but important words in here that speak volumes to the people of faith. Those two words are must and shortly. The Lamb is the one who's over all things and doing all things in this book. God sent his holy angel and showed it to one of Jesus' apostles, John. These things must be done. There's no possibility that there will be any deviation from this word. There's no possibility that some of this word will not be true or that it has been slightly modified before it got to us, his servants. The angel said it, and we can say it with equal confidence. These things must be done. We are counting on it. His servants are fully yielded themselves to the truth of it. Not only do we completely trust that these things must be done, but they must shortly be done. When the devil has come down to us having great wrath, when the kings of the armies of the world have gathered themselves against Christ, when the spirit of Babylon has overtaken the whole world and corrupted seemingly everything, when the world presses upon us and vexes us from day to day, when we are reviled, troubled on every side, perplexed, persecuted, and cast down, we need to hear that these things must shortly be done. Yes. When we read that the Deliverer will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and that Babylon is going to fall, and that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, and that God's king is going to smite the nations and rule them with the rod of iron and break them to shivers like a potter's vessel, and that fire is going to come down from heaven and devour them, and the devil and the beast and the false prophet, as well as all those who were deceived by them, are cast into the lake of fire, and death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire, we need to hear that these things must shortly be done. Amen. And when we hear about eating of the tree of life in the paradise of God, and a crown of life, and a new name, and a white stone, and having power over the nations, and hearing Jesus confess our names before the Father and the holy angels, and being a pillar in the temple of God, and sitting with Christ in his throne, and no tears, no death, no sorrow, nor crying, or pain, 
and drinking of the fountain of the water of life freely and eating of the tree of life and no more curse and seeing his face and serving him where there is no night but the Lord God giveth them light and reigning with Christ forever and ever. Amen. Then the saints love to hear these blessed words of the holy angel, the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Amen. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. <laughs> now shortly has to do with time. Now people who are not living by faith, they always want to know what time, how much longer, when if you can get even close, give us a date when you think Jesus is going to come back. <clears throat> now, if you're concerned with time, here's what you need to know. He who cannot lie, the God of the holy prophets who sent his holy angel to show these things to his servants, has said shortly. Yeah. Now, if you think you need more information than that, then there's a lot that you're missing. <clears throat> yeah. Quickly, a little while and shortly are precisely the words that the saints need to hear. Yes. And the last two words of this verse are be done, not happen. Not these are the things which must shortly happen. These are things that are going to be done. Yeah. <clears throat> Happenstance indicates chance or good fortune or bad fortune, uncontrolled and uncontrollable things. <clears throat> but God is not in the business of revealing things that are going to happen. He reveals that which he is going to do. In particular, the things that we read of in the book of the Revelation are the things that Jesus Christ has done, is doing, and is going to do. Things that must be done and that no other can do, <clears throat> except for the Lamb. And in the next verse, the Lamb gives his own affirmation of what has been given to us. Verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now in some Bibles, this is printed in the red ink. In other Bibles, it's not. <clears throat> but even if the angel spoke this, it's the same as if it came from the mouth of Jesus. This, only Jesus says this. No one else says, Behold, I come quickly. No one else says that. <clears throat> no one else can say that. He's the only one that we look for to come. Yeah. Only the second coming of Jesus Christ can cause the passing away of the present heaven and earth and usher in the judgment and the eternal world to come. The coming of our Lord signals the time that we have waited for has come. When he comes, then the wicked will cease from troubling. And the blessedness of the new Jerusalem, the holy city, will be upon us. When Jesus comes, then God will have fulfilled what he has designed and purposed in Jesus Christ. Waiting will be done. Living by faith will be obsolete. Warfare will be over. The prize will have been won. Therefore, the Lord confirms this truth to the saints. Here's that word again, quickly. Jesus is speaking to all believers, saying these things must be done shortly, and I am going to come quickly. Behold, pay attention now. Watch for this, be alert and looking. I'm coming quickly. And Jesus says, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. <clears throat> and this, that's connected with, Behold, I come quickly. Those two go together. Yeah. I'm coming quickly, therefore, blessed is he that keeps the sayings yeah. of the prophecy of this book. <clears throat> Jesus will come quickly to save those who keep the sayings of this prophecy. <clears throat> And those who keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book are those who believe that Jesus is coming quickly. He who keeps the sayings is he who believes the record that God has given of his Son. The things that John saw have the ministry of hope to the people of God. We hope for it, therefore we patiently wait for it. And Jesus says, blessed is, in the present tense. He doesn't say blessed will be, but blessed is. Believing this report makes you blessed in the present time <clears throat> because it empowers you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, if you're being taught to live this way, it's only by the grace of God, and you are therefore blessed. Keeping these sayings means that this believing, righteous living, and hoping is being worked out in you. And that's a blessed state. Paul spoke of the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, <clears throat> yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but, here it is again, for a moment. Amen. There it is again. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while it works, it works for us while... We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And we've probably all experienced this failure where you thought your afflictions were very heavy and you couldn't bear them. And it's like Jesus says to you, you're looking the wrong way. Yeah. Affliction seems heavy, you're looking at the wrong thing. Right. Look on the things above. Right. This, this is a light affliction. And when it's gone, just, just for a moment. Yeah. But for a moment. Yeah. <clears throat> now that's keeping the sayings of the prophecy of this book being lived out. That's tasting of the powers of the world to come. Mm -hmm. The saints' desire for the world to come overpowers any desires for things that are seen and that are temporal. So if your desire to experience those things that Jesus has promised to those who overcome the world and to take your part in the new Jerusalem, the temple of God, is stronger than any other desire, then you are keeping his sayings. And whoever lives like this is blessed. Amen. Jesus is coming quickly for these people. Yeah. This is how our light affliction works for us. It works for us while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. <clears throat> and certainly we will also be blessed when he comes. When Jesus comes again, he will instantly find each one of us. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And again, I want to draw your attention to the agreement between what the angel said and what the Lamb, Jesus Christ, has said here. <clears throat> Jesus says the prophecy of this book not just keeping the sayings, but keeping the sayings of the prophecy of this book. <clears throat> He's establishing again that this book of the Revelation is a prophecy of what the Lamb is going to do, or as the angel said, must be done. God's not asking that we believe some mystical words that some men wrote down about an unseen deity. He demands that we believe what he said he is going to do. The prophecy of this book is the very word of God. It's the holy scriptures in which it seems that all of heaven is involved in delivering to men. God determined it and is seen on the throne in chapter 4. Christ is seen and heard throughout the book. Angels deliver it to the apostle John in visions, and John wrote it down for all the saints. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. <clears throat> And verse 8, And I, John, saw these things and heard them. Not just the things that the angel said <clears throat> and that Jesus said in the previous two verses, but this, again, I believe is in reference to the entire book. John, at the close of this book, he's giving his personal testimony of what he's written down. <clears throat> the holy apostle gives his personal testimony that he has both seen and heard all the things recorded from Revelation 1, 1 to the end of Revelation chapter 22. You know, in John's gospel account, he does not use his own name. But here in the Revelation, <clears throat> he makes his own name known five times. It looks to me like he is trying to emphasize that this is true <clears throat> and the dependability of what he recorded in this book. John did not receive this from another prophet. He did not assemble this book from a compilation of writings and visions of other men. No other man contributed to the book of the Revelation. 
John is testifying that he alone received these things in a heavenly vision to give to the people of God. This came from heaven to John's pen to you. I, John, saw these things and heard them. Nothing has been altered. Nothing has been watered down or reinterpreted. We have the very things that John saw and heard. <clears throat> Now it's grievous that so many people in the churches are not able to receive the truth like this. Yeah. So many have been taught that God at some point in time abandoned his safekeeping of his own word and left it to men to do with whatever they pleased. <clears throat> this is an abominable lie. God has never, never left his word to the sole stewardship of men, Amen. not even holy men. He personally keeps it pure so that his saints can keep themselves pure. Yeah. Not only does the angel in Jesus Christ testify to this truth, but now so does the apostle John. Now John, here at the end of this revelation, the angel has signaled the end, and he has heard a word from Jesus himself <clears throat> about the things that John has heard and seen in this book. And this tender-hearted apostle has just taken a great deal of marvelous things in to his heart <clears throat> through things that he's seen and heard in this book. <clears throat> and it appears that he's nearly overwhelmed at the glory of it all. He says, And when I heard and seen, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. <clears throat> Now, before we address this, I want, we should remember now that we're talking about the Apostle John yeah. and not some other man who was maybe new in the faith or unfamiliar with God. <clears throat> John personally walked with Jesus. John saw Jesus glorified and transfigured in the mount, along with Moses and Elijah, who were bright and shining, <clears throat> which was certainly not an everyday sight. John heard God speak from heaven. John saw, more than once, John saw the dead raised. John saw innumerable miracles performed by Jesus. And we're not talking like small-time stuff like my arm used to hurt and now it doesn't hurt. We're talking about, and he healed them all, and casting out demons, and these kinds, raising the dead. John saw all these things. <clears throat> John saw the resurrected Christ taken up to heaven in a cloud. And that event was attended by two angels. <clears throat> so John was no stranger to divine working, and not even to the appearance of heavenly persons. Now, the thing that caused John to fall down was not just the appearance of an angel. This angel had been with John, <clears throat> or at least this angel and perhaps others, since the very beginning of the book. So if John were prone to worshiping heavenly personalities, he would have fallen down numerous times. <clears throat> Perhaps way back in chapter 5, when one of the elders that are before the throne told him not to weep because the lion of the tribe of Judah had prevailed to open the book. But John didn't fall down and worship that elder. Another one of the elders spoke to him in chapter 7, but John didn't fall down there. <clears throat> in chapter 10, John took a book out of the hand of an angel. <clears throat> Now, if you think that's, think about that. Now, John took a book out of the hand of an angel. Let me describe this angel to you. Revelation 10, 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun. And his feet as pillars of fire. That's the one he took the book out of his hand. <clears throat> And the angel spoke to him in chapter 11. Chapter 17, one of the angels talked with him concerning the judgment of the great horror Babylon. So in this vision, John numerous times has not only seen but conversed with and even had like very close contact with angels <clears throat> doing the work of the Lord. He saw 24 elders before the throne and four beasts that are before the throne. Anyone want to elaborate on those? Nobody's ever seen that but John. There they are. <clears throat> we'll, we'll find out when the Lord comes. John saw the throne of God and the glorified Lamb, but none of these things caused him to fall down and worship. <clears throat> now it's recorded two times, John himself recorded, 
two times in the book of the Revelation that he fell down to worship at the feet of an angel. Now, the first time was in chapter 19, yeah. verse 9 and 10. It's almost verbatim what we just read in chapter 22. Mm -hmm. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then again in our text, Revelation 22, verse 8, the same thing happens again. <clears throat> but let's not jar charge John foolishly. <clears throat> it's not as though John frequently forgot all about God and forgot about Christ and frequently lapped in, lapsed into the worship of angels. <clears throat> John was not an idolater, not ever. The thing that caused John to fall down and worship was not just the presence of a holy angel. We've easily established that John was no stranger to divine working and supernatural things. <clears throat> the thing that caused John to fall down and worship was what he had just been given, what he was receiving from God. And he, he was falling down before the one who brought it to him. It's true that there's no new doctrine in the book of the Revelation, but it's also true that no man on earth before nor since has been given to see the things that John was given. Right. Not in such scope, not in such glorious detail, not accompanied by so many heavenly scenes and personalities. Amen. Consider the volume of what John was given to see, 22 chapters of just pure heavenly scenery. And what John saw and heard was not some small matter. <clears throat> it's, it even required the, the help of angels to, to take him to see the right things and understand the right things. So when John fell down before the angel, it's not because he viewed the angel as a god to be worshipped. <clears throat> And the word worship here has a very broad meaning. The essence of which is cognizance and thanksgiving. John, John's attempted worship was a worship of thanksgiving for all the angel had shown him. It was to honor the angel, but not to honor the angel as John honors God and honors Christ. John knows better than that. And if John doesn't know better than that, we would be right to ask, why did God give this revelation to him? But John does know better. This is the Apostle John now. There's, again, I, it grieves me that to hear people speak derogatorily about people of faith in the Scripture. In no way and at no time did John think that the angel was better than God or Christ. John never thought that any angel was worthy of more honor than God. John did not forget God. John's falling down at the feet of an angel twice was the outpouring of his gratitude for the marvelous things he had been given by them. <clears throat> and I think it's fair that we ask ourselves, what would we do if we had been given what John had been given? <clears throat> what would you do if an angel showed you all these things and spoke to you? Now let's also look at a couple of other examples in Scripture. Something similar happened to the Apostle Peter when he first met Cornelius. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now the scriptures plainly tell us Cornelius was a just man. As a matter of fact, before this, an angel came to Cornelius and told him to send for the apostle Peter. <clears throat> so Cornelius, he, was, he didn't mistake Peter for God. Cornelius didn't suddenly lapse into the worship of men. Again, this was his reaction to such great grace being brought to him, especially a Gentile, that God would send an angel to Cornelius and, and one of Christ's holy apostles. That, this was almost overwhelming to him. Cornelius did this because he sensed the magnitude of the situation, and he was very grateful. His attempt to word it, worship Peter was an expression of gratitude, not, not to be confused with the worship of deity. Consider also one of the promises that Jesus made to the church in Philadelphia. Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them 
to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. <clears throat> now, again, I'm, what I'm demonstrating through scripture here is that the word worship has a very broad meaning. <clears throat> He's not saying that, that these these men are going to come and worship at your feet as though you were God, and they're not going to be worshiping in thanksgiving and gratitude to you like, like John attempted to do or Cornelius. What, but we're, we're seeing here that this can mean more than just worship of deity. That's, I'm kinda, I feel very clumsy doing this, but <clears throat> I hope you understand what I'm, what I'm saying. There's a broad definition to the word worship. And Jesus, now Jesus said he is going to make... Jesus is going to make some certain men worship at the feet of other certain men. So now whatever you think about uh, worship, you'll have to fit that into it. <clears throat> and nevertheless, Peter did stop Cornelius and the angels, both of them did stop John from doing what they were doing. <clears throat> Not because John had idolized the angels, <clears throat> but in both cases, the angels give their reason why they stopped John. Verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. <clears throat> Don't worship me. Don't give your thanks to me or honor to me, because, John, I, I'm a servant just like you. I'm one of your brethren, the prophets. There's one higher than me that you should give your thanks to. My, I'm going to kind of go out on a limb a little bit farther here. <clears throat> and say that my understanding of this is not, my understanding is that it was not wrong for John to do this. <clears throat> and it would not have been wrong for the angel to receive this John's worship at, as defined, because it was the expression of honor and gratitude. But the angel refused it because that was not his business with John. <clears throat> the angel was saying again, I'm like you, John, in that I have nothing that was not given to me except by God. <clears throat> had nothing that was not given to me <clears throat> but of God. And the holy angels are exclusively the ministers of God, therefore this angel would not receive anything that made himself the center of attention. <clears throat> and the same is true in the case of Peter and Cornelius. <clears throat> so this is a good thing for all believers to remember. Being men, we are prone to receive the praise of men and honor and thanksgiving and other advantages from other men. But if our business is truly to serve God, then let us defer all manner of honor to him alone. Amen. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. And the time will come that God will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, then shall every man have praise of God. That's on the agenda too. It's revealed here also that the angels are also keeping the sayings of this book. They are also waiting for all of this to be fulfilled. They are watching what the Lamb is doing. They too are waiting for the judgment in which they have a prominent part and waiting for the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. So men and angels are in this together from this perspective. We are all watching to see how our God will fulfill his word. We are watching by faith, and you might say they are watching by sight. <clears throat> but we are all waiting, like good servants wait on their master for his word to be fulfilled. So then the final word is worship God. If you are blessed by reading the words of this book, as John wrote, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Then the Apostle John, and the holy angels, and Jesus Christ, the Lamb himself, testify to us that these things are faithful and true. These things were given to you to bless you, the servants of God. Worship God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>